folks, good evening. Thanks for coming out to the Woods Branch. I'm your host, Dave Lamb, one of the librarians here. Uh, as many of you know, we are honored and pleased to have Steve Rosen, who has been out here previously, talking on a variety of subjects, usually military-related. Tonight we have him doing the Gales of November, sinking in the Edmund Fitzgerald. And uh, Steve is the, as, a, as many of you heard him say earlier, is the director at Selfridge. And uh, with that, let's Steve. I just did some quick calculations, and uh, this coming November 10th will be the 48th anniversary of the loss of the Fitzgerald. 48 years ago. And I'm very happy to report we haven't lost a ship since then. So, it's a testament to uh, marine engineering, naval engineering, and uh, seamanship. Just start. Those at the Vegas one. What's that? Those at the Vegas. So far? Yeah. Yeah. At this particular point, that's what it is. And, uh, uh, well, uh, it's called Gales of November. You've probably heard that. There's a lot of books uh, about. I don't know if we've got any of them here. Gales of November. But, um, the, uh, Great Lakes is the largest body of fresh water in the world, and it's centralized. And, and uh, as some, I saw a bumper sticker that said, four out, of, uh, four out of five Great Lakes prefer Michigan. We count it. But uh, now here they are. Um, the water comes in, the watershed comes in. It's, uh, you can't really see where the water actually comes from, but up in the north, around all that, Know that they get up there. Hopefully, it's up there, not down here. Then uh, that all uh, melts and enters uh, streams and rivers, which eventually work their way toward the the lakes itself. And the uh, water comes into the uh, Lake Superior. Lake Superior is actually uh, 18 feet higher than the rest of the Great Lakes. That's why you have to have uh, the locks at Sault Ste. Marie. And all that water pours down from the, the Sioux Locks over here into uh, from Georgian Bay down into Lake uh, Huron. All the water from Lake Michigan rolls through. If you go through, uh, I never dove in the straits, um, um, uh, but it, I know friends are divers there, and there's a noticeable current going from west to east. So all that water from Lake Michigan is pouring into Lake Huron. And so with all that water from Lake, Huron, uh, Lake Superior uh, enters Lake Huron, all that water is forced down, right? Uh, if you look underneath the, uh, uh, the Blue Water Bridge of Port Huron, you can actually see all the current, with all the jetties, uh, eddies from all that water being forced down into uh, the St. Clair River. And uh, comes down this way here. Um, you know, they right around Harsons Island, Harsons <coughs> Island. Uh, all of that is actually a delta, because all that water was uh, carrying a lot of sediment over the years before we got here. And then the, the water hits the, the lake, and it just drops it. So that's where all that's where Harsons Island came from. All that water fills up into here, uh, Lake uh, Saint Clair, and then down to the. Uh, Detroit River down and emptying into Lake Erie, of course, and then there's a, a high plateau over here. Um, actually, if you look at it from where you're at, you can see things. The oldest part, from geologically speaking, is right here, uh, and the rest of it is, is channeled out like this. So, this is the oldest rock material here, and then you have, it comes down and so the parts like over here and over here. Actually, if you look at this area here, it goes all the way around. Connects with that, comes all the way here. It's called the Niagara Escarpment. That connects all the way over here. And there's a concentric circles. You see a lot of it. And uh, it all impacts with the uplifting, I'm giving you a geology lesson. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with the Fitzgerald, but uh, it has uh, as the, uh, the ground was pushed down by the, uh, the glaciers, uh, it, it, down, it went down, the ground was actually, the surface of the earth was actually pushed down, 
and as the glaciers began to melt, uh, this ground came up. And it was pretty much level. That explains why, you know, we're pretty flat over here. There's some hills, a little bit over here and a little bit over there. Other than that, pretty flat. So all that uh, drainage patterns that came about, uh, once all the ice was gone, uh, it stabilized to where it's at right now with all the water coming through, as I kind of talked about earlier. Uh, the water has to go somewhere, so it went up the St. Lawrence River, eventually into the estuary, and entered uh, into the Atlantic Ocean up there. And uh, through a series of locks, and uh, they're able to put shipping in. Uh, salt water boats are supposed to, are able to come into the Great Lakes and, and uh, stabilize all the, uh, the boats coming into the, uh, the lakes, commerce, moving things around. Just for ex initially it was for exploration and like the Griffin, you know, moving furs from one trading post to the other, getting them down to market back in the 60, early 1600s. So, I mean, the Great Lakes is just from the very beginning has established itself as a just an incredible body of water uh, and it helped uh, our development of our country. Um, now the, uh, the lakes, you know, I've had all, all, all uh, in the past I've had people ask how deep the lakes are and, and uh, of course the, the shallow ones over here, uh, Lake Erie is 210 feet and um, uh, Lake Huron comes in at 750 feet, and uh, Lake Ontario is actually deeper, and that it's uh, 802 feet over here, and that's 975 feet over here, and the deepest part of Lake Superior is 1,332 feet, and that is right about over there, and it's really, really deep. As you go down, it gets really, really dark. Uh, but I don't think that anything's ever been down that deep. But, so that's that's uh, that's our Great Lakes. Of course, we're right in the middle of it. So now, what we're going to be concerned about is the uh, geography of Lake Superior. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad pointed out there's an old Indian legend uh, talks about a wolf, and uh, it does look like a wolf's head. Look at it. Now you have the mouth over here, the eye over there, and the nose over here for the wolf's head. And uh, yeah, 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 a couple of glasses of wine and it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> it pops right out. So, and then you have Whitefish Bay here, you have uh, Whitefish Point, and uh, enter into uh, the Sioux Locks over here, the key went on. And uh, particularly, as far as we're concerned, there's two points I wanted to indicate to you. Is the two islands over here, uh, over on the eastern end of the lake itself. Mission Cotton Island is up here, very easy to see. And this little dot over here is called Caribou Island. And uh, that's going to play a, a pretty uh, predominant role in, in the chain of events I'll be talking about uh, shortly. So right about over here is that deep part, 1,332 feet. And uh, uh, what happened, I'm going to be, I'll be talking about it more later on, but I think, well, I got the map here. Uh, here's Duluth right over here. And uh, you had uh, a couple of ships that left. Uh, actually, the uh, Arthur Anderson left first. And uh, was headed out, and then the Fitzgerald, which was a little faster, about two or three miles an hour faster, uh, was able to take overtake the Anderson over in this part, and uh, stayed down south of Isle Royal, and pushed up to the north over there in that far corner, and then made the run in here. That was the game plan. So we'll uh, we'll talk more about that later. Well, the ship in question was the uh, uh, Edmund Fitzgerald. I don't think you recognize this, but this is uh, this is the, the Lake the Keel of uh, the basis for the, uh, the ship itself. These are the cargo holds. Uh, there were several of them 
that was um, separated. And all the iron, the, the taconite, that's an iron, it's a low grade iron ore, but there's a lot of it up um, in the Sabi Range up near uh, the Wisconsin, Minnesota area over there. So a lot of the taconite was mined as processed into pellets. And um, they, uh, it's easier to, to ship and to use and everything else if it's in those little pellets. It looks like marble, it's about the size of a dime, approximately. And uh, that's how iron ore is transported. Um, so, but the, the keel here was laid down, and this is uh, 1957, November 57, and it was uh, the ship was built at Great Lakes Engineering Works in Wyandotte, and uh, uh, it's now a, a shipping uh, port authority, Detroit Port Authority over there. But uh, this the slip where the ship would slide into the water for the first time, 1958, um, is still there. So if you ever, in the neighborhood, you know, you can, you can go over there and actually see it. Or if you're in a boat, Michigan has more registered boats than anywhere else in the, in the United States, you can sail past it and see it as well. It's very easy to see. They, they uh, tried to take, what they, they built the ship, they built it in sections. And then they put the sections together. And this was one of the first ships that was built that way. And here's the, the fits the hull about to be launched. A lot of people here watching it. And uh, uh, we just slide into the water. Uh, does anyone know what, uh, where, who Edmund Fitzgerald was? He was named of a, uh, there was an uh, insurance company in Milwaukee. And uh, I think it's called Milwaukee Life or something like that. I don't know in that part of it. But he was the president, the CEO of uh, this insurance company. And his name was Edmund Fitzgerald. And uh, the company, as an investment venture, uh, had the ship built and then they were going to lease it, which they did to Columbia Transportation Company. And uh, the ship sailed under the Columbia um, Transportation Company colors. And on the bottom, under Edmund Fitzgerald, it says Milwaukee, because that's the insurance company that owned the ship. So, so now if you're on Jeopardy and they ask you the question, <laughs> you know, the answer to that. Yeah. And this is the uh, the fits here at the water line. Uh, it was uh, built. It was 729 feet long at the time it was built. It was the uh, the largest ship on the Great Lakes, and uh, it captured so many records for for tonnage transported uh, annually, uh, and it was a very quick boat. Well, fast as it seems to be go. Uh, it was usually about two to three, four uh, miles an hour faster than other boats. But, uh, you know, you have the bow section over here. Um, the, the pilot house up over here had two radar uh, uh, systems on board the ship. Plan, you know, your, your primary and your secondary. Um, the hatch covers over here. And then the crew is down here, your engine room. Uh, your galley are over here, your crew, quarters, everything was that part of it was right here. This is the uh, insignia of the, uh, the stack color for the Columbia Transportation Company, Cleveland Cliffs. Great thing. I only had two lifeboats, but maybe that's all you really needed, right? You know, so. What year was it built? Uh, it was built in 58. It was launched in 58, but that one. Any questions about the fits at this point? <coughs> How many years did it take to build it? Uh, probably a little over a year and a half. So. And this here is the fits coming through uh, St. Clair River. Obviously, when you see them, well, you can barely see it here, but 
you have the anchor wells over here, which are pretty low in the water, so uh, she's headed down, as the term goes, and uh, the anchors are pretty close to the, the water line, you know, that you know, she's still usually to come down. When they come from Port Detroit, uh, they usually are uh, cool. And uh, you can see the, uh, the radar up there, and it has a Canadian flag, but they, what they do is the, you'll see the ships, if you look at them, on the side that's closest to Canada will have a Canadian flag and the first American flag as respect to the two countries uh, that share the Great Lakes. Well, we're headed right now. We're on the cusp of uh, the existing annual storm system that come out. Normally, between, I think they put it the last week of October and the first three weeks of November at that time period, we're pretty volatile on the Great Lakes. And you usually will you'll find yourself in a storm at some place during that time period. And you have, uh, in this particular case, you have warm water, uh, warm air coming out of the south, and you have all this cold air. I don't know if you got too much cold air coming out from the north yet, but it's going to happen. And uh, it tends to cross the, uh, the Great Lakes, usually uh, Superior and Michigan get the storm first, and then they come across the state and, and get the uh, Lake Huron. Not too much happens in uh, Lake uh, Erie. Of course, Lake Erie, because it's so shallow, you have the, the storms, well, I can't show you here, but they, the high winds coming across from Indiana and northern Ohio, because it's all flat as an ironing board there nothing to stop the wind, but it keeps the air moves rapidly across. And that's why if you're a boater and you're on Lake Erie, it could be great, you know, you have three, four foot seas, and then you have the uh, small craft warnings come on telling you to get off the lake because of the air coming through will kick up and you know, it won't take long to have anywhere from six, eight, ten foot waves on, you know, bounce you around and everything else. So, Lake Erie, just because it's shallow, it, it really is unstable because of the geography of the air coming in across. Here you have the uh, low pressure area coming up at not that time, and then the uh, uh, cold air and high pressure area coming down from the north. <coughs> And uh, it's, uh, the keel was laid in, as you saw, August uh, 1957, the Great Lakes Engineering Corps. 729 feet in length and a beam of 75 feet. Normally, ships at that time were about 75 foot across, you know, beam wise. Depth of 39 feet, a carrying capacity of 31,000 tons. It's amazing. But now you've got 1,000 uh, footers out there that can carry uh, almost twice that much. Uh, on the lakes. And as an end result, because you have thousands there, last time I looked, there was uh, 13,000 uh, footers, 13 ships out there that belong to someone that are uh, 1,000 feet or bigger. It's like 1,005 or something like that. And, uh, and they can carry quite a bit. Sir? If you don't mind going back to the other uh, slide for a second. Sure. My glasses. Oops. This one? So yes. Uh, since the that uh, superior is the deepest of them, I was curious to know why the ship's path took that path versus the shorter cut. Well, these boats aren't very maneuverable. So if you want to get on a course that goes really straight. Actually, this is basically how ships still go pretty now, pretty great now. Uh, the, uh, it'll stay pretty close to Isle Royal. They'll come out, they, they don't go this way. Uh, they, they usually, think it's easier for the ship just go straight up and then straight down without too much maneuvering. Because they, they can't maneuver that well. So that's, that's pretty much what happens. Good question.
how long was he? How long was that uh, that storm, or how long was that lake uh, um, turned well, up before they got? When when they, when they left uh, Duluth that morning, uh, it was you know just like this morning. It was uh, the sun was shining, it was rather warm, but uh, because of the changing atmospheric conditions, uh, it, both captains. Uh, Captain McSorley on the uh, uh, Fitzgerald and Captain uh, Bernie Cooper on the Anderson, they knew what was coming. They knew a storm was going to come. That's why they chose to stay as far north as possible to stay away from the, uh, the rough seas. It would be a little bit more bearable uh, further north you are. And uh, so they left. It was really nice sailing weather. It was great, but they knew things were going to be deteriorating. When they got to right about uh, a little bit past uh, uh, Al Royal, things began to deteriorate as they anticipated. So I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Let me just. Uh, <coughs> so here you have the, the courses that they were on, and the fits would be obviously in red, but they uh, they wanted to stay as close, far north as possible because of the existing storm. Right about over here, storm began to hit, and this is where things began to happen. Uh, first of all, uh, the storm knocked out both radars on the uh, Fitzgerald. Pretty much blind, can't see anything. So there is recorded uh, radio conversation between McSorley and, and Cooper, um, uh, where McSorley mentions he's lost his radar and asks if the Anderson can help them out. Of course, they are more than willing. So the Fitzgerald had to slow down, check their speed, so they stayed within uh, uh, the radar range of the Anderson, which is 10 miles radius. So they had to slow down so that the uh, Fitzgerald would start showing up on the Anderson's radar, and then they can give information, navigational information to the Fitzgerald, be able to navigate up in here, and then make that run come in. And then Fitzgerald was planning on getting the radar repaired once she was over here. So uh, it was just a, a, a very convenient. And of course, you know, you're on the water, you know, you're, you're going to do everything you can to assist another, another ship uh, whenever it's possible. So that's the course, it's pretty much courses they were, they were headed into. Is, was the second, was that storm the second? <coughs> yeah, were they? So the red line kind of ends with the two lines right here on that last straight line? Right here? Yes. Yeah, there's just Caribou Island and Fisher Cotton Island. Yeah. Um, one of the, well, hard to tell, but I think it, was, yeah, it might be here or there. But it, it comes down, it's, this isn't a detailed map, you know, there's something else we're going to talk about. But uh, the uh, fits coming in here, um, um, I can talk about more about that later. Did the Anderson end up moving ahead of the Fitzgerald? No, no, always stayed in. And Fitzgerald, the Anderson, she was a little slower ship, uh, so she was slowing down so that the, actually she wasn't, she didn't change her speed at all, but the Fitzgerald slowed down so she could, uh, they could close that distance. Because when you started to move up over here, the Fitzgerald, even though the Anderson was pulled out first, uh, by the time they got over here, the Fitzgerald was about two mi uh, about ten miles, uh, more a little bit more than ten miles ahead of the Anderson. So they had to check. She had to check her speed down so she came in and would be able to show up on the radar of the Anderson. Anderson just kept her speed constant and uh, came down. Okay. Now there's the Arthur Anderson. Now, I haven't been keeping up on this, but there was, back when I was last worked at uh, Dawson, there was uh, talk about the uh, Anderson being retired. So I don't know if that actually took place, but, uh, you know, it was like the end of an era. Sometimes it gets to be a little too, more expen too expensive to put the ship out, because what they were doing is every other year, the company would, um, rotate their fleet. Some use some ships one year, the other ships the next year, and that extends the life of your ship. 
And uh, so it was like every other year the Anderson would come out. And when the Anderson would be coming down uh, in the Detroit River, we'd get a lot of people coming to the Dawson uh, because to see the Anderson, because there's bits and pieces of all three ships come together. Anchor of the Fitzgerald, the pilot house that William Clay Ford, and the Arthur Anderson. So it's like one time they all come together at one point. And uh, so there's talk about the Anderson being uh, decommissioned and scrapped. So I uh, haven't heard too much about that. She's still in service as of right now, though. Still in service? Okay. Yep. Good. We're happy to see that. You know, another interesting thing is during this evening, you know, the, the night of November 10th, 1975, the Anderson was actually longer than the Fitzgerald. And that's because they, during that time period, they were involved with a, uh, a lengthening process. Uh, they would add an extra 120 feet. And I believe the uh, Fitzgerald, not, excuse me, the Anderson, had been lengthened uh, 120 feet uh, and, and we put out to sea again uh, earlier that same year, 1975. And so the, uh, uh, at, the at that particular time, the, the Arthur Anderson was 767 feet and uh, the Fitzgerald, of course, was 729. So maybe about 40 feet bigger. What's the logo underneath the Arthur and the Anderson? Uh, that's the uh, company I forget she belonged to. U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel? Okay, I'm forgetting. USS is beyond there, United States Steel. And then yeah, the stack is, you know, black top and silver funnel. So, yeah, thank you. And uh, but here she's empty. Uh, the anchors are way out of the water. So she's laid up. I think this was just, she might have been just laid up uh, uh, for the winter. They always do that. There's a, it's in January where they, all of them, they lock the, uh, the Sioux locks. And so everyone knows when the drop dead time is. So they, they're, they're leaving um, Duluth. Uh, some boats are laid up in, in Duluth or near, down in Superior. Uh, Wisconsin, a lot of the ships, so they head out, they load up one last time, they make the run to get out of uh, Lake uh, Superior before the winter layup, and then make that last run in. It all depends on whether there's demand for the steel. And like, I'm, I'm curious, because the automobile strike, are they still moving? Record not, are they going to lay up early because there's no demand for the steel? I don't know. But that, that will play into it as well. So the boats are going to be heading down to uh, they come down, and they either, they lay up either in Detroit area, or they go down to Cleveland or uh, um, Erie, Pennsylvania, or Conneo, Ohio, places like that. They just lay up there, Lorain, Ohio, and they and even Toledo. But if you drive go across I seventy five there. Sometimes you'll see ships there, and what they do is they pump all the water out of the ballast tanks, so they're high out of the water, so that the ice has no impact on it. It just pushes them up a little bit, and that's it. So. Now conditions uh, on the lakes is kind of give you an idea what they had to go through. They had the running lights on. And this is the lights that uh, the Anderson would have been able to see from uh, their distance, like nine and a half miles, roughly, and be able to tell where, where the Fitzgerald is and give them uh, uh, bearings on where they're going and where they're headed. And uh, yeah, the Fitzgerald was carrying 26,186 tons of tackle. Uh, shortly earlier, uh, earlier in the year, uh, the Coast Guard gave the ship permission <coughs> to go six feet deeper into the water. I mean, they're minimizing their freeport space by six feet. I've had people question, well, maybe that's why it's ship. No, I don't know. It just the Coast Guard wouldn't allow that if, if it wouldn't have been to save the ship. So. 
Uh, there were some questions about the Fitzgerald, and they uh, they reinforced the top deck uh, a number of years earlier, about ten years earlier, because they noticed some uh, anomalies with the uh, stability of the ship. Uh, there was comments about the about the, the deck itself moving, and so they they laid on some more. They made it a little thicker to get the ship some more support. That was about ten, roughly about ten years before the accident. So, but it was a very stable ship. She uh, she'd gone through carrying record numbers of uh, of uh, cargo, so down from uh, Duluth all the way down to uh, Detroit and Cleveland, and uh, making money for the for the company. So mm -hmm. now this. Uh, Different theories about what happened. Of course, no one really knows. But uh, due speculation and been talking to people who've been on the crew. Now I pointed out those two islands in the uh, eastern end of the Lake Superior. Michigan, the, the, the Fitzgerald was way clear of that, so that, you know, it's pretty good to see. You know, pretty obvious, very easy to see. But coming down uh, Caribou Island. The uh, Fitzgerald was given correct force headings uh, from the Anderson, but uh, winds were blowing the ship further to the south. And uh, got a little, just the northern part of Lake of, of uh, Caribou Island is an area called Six Fathom Shoals. Well, Six Fathoms is 36 feet, six feet and a fathom. This is a fathom. And uh, so six of those, that's roughly 36 feet. But the, uh, uh, the actual depth of the six bathroom shoals is closer to 18 to 20 feet. So if you've got too close to Caribou Island, and with the waves, you know, 30, 35 foot you know, seas, you know, can go up and then come right back down again. So the people I've talked with, the prevailing theory is that she got too close. Because actually, uh, Captain uh, Cooper was, was watching the Fitzgerald come into this area, and he actually said on the radio, that's a lot closer than I want to be. So that gives some speculation. Here's a, a very capable uh, uh, seaman who's been on the, uh, the lakes for a long, long time, over 30, 30, over 30 years, and uh, saw where the Fitzgerald was headed. And uh, of course, the Fitzgerald wouldn't have any. They've been in constant contact back and forth. But that's to start drifting close to uh, Caribou Island. The uh, after the accident, there were divers that went in to explore the area, looking for paint on the rocks as an indication that you get that. Uh, there was they, no one found any indication that there's paint on any rocks or indicating that. There's any evidence that the Fitzgerald actually did get something over there. At that particular point, you know, it's probably like 15 years, 20 years after the accident, and uh, they didn't see anything. There. But uh, it's believed that the Fitzgerald was carrying uh, <coughs> cargo by rocking back and forth into the waves, and if she would have damaged the hull in this region of the here, what they suspect that water would have been started you know, going into the ship itself, lowering the bow down into the water, or into the waves, or you take a wave and it goes right over the top of your pilot house, rolling right over it. And uh, water coming inside, you're taking in water, and it gets to the point where the bow starts to not come back out again. You just lost all buoyancy in the bow and being able to go in. Water filling up the rest of the ship the stress point is in the midship section, so the bow section broke off and headed toward the bottom, and the bow section was 276 feet. That part of it went all the way down, straight down, getting the bottom, and then laying right side up. All the windows later on you'll see um, in the pilot house blew in, so at that point it was, it was all over for everyone in the pilot house. Uh, the stern section uh, was the last to go under, and uh, 
midship section, approximately 200 feet of that uh, disintegrated. The stern section, roughly, I think it's 253 feet, uh, began to follow everything else and started to go down. Uh, the, the torque, the screws were still turning, so the ship is still underway. The engines are still running. And uh, the torque from the, as she's underwater, the torque from the screws turning from the ship uh, the stern section to lay uh, totally inverted upside down. Um, there's no indication, no one knew that the ship was actually sinking. So no one made any real attempts to abandon the ship. There's no signal to abandon the ship. There's a bell system throughout the ships. You hear that, you know. Now we have things called uh, exposure suits. You put them on. Uh, unlike the people on the Titanic, which you know, you're, most of them died of, uh, of exposure, hypothermia. You know, the, uh, you're required to have your own exposure suit that goes right on over your uh, your clothes and has a watertight zipper on it. And it's in bright uh, orange color. It has a, uh, uh, the ones we had at Dawson that we showed people we had an inflatable vest up on top, hard so that it would give you more points to keep your head out of the water. Your gloves had three fingers on it, so you keep these fingers together to try to keep them warm. And it's about a quarter inch of neoprene foam is what they're made out of. And uh, it's just right up, and you, you, there's a hood that goes on, and it's just a little bit of your face sticking out. The rest of it would have been kept. It, it, the whole idea is to extend your life uh, in a cold condition, something like this. Uh, the crew never had a chance to do anything like that whatsoever. They all, the ship went down, and I firmly believe no one even knew they were sinking at that point. Uh, it broke off, bow section hit, stern section is a large debris field around the area, and then the uh, stern section came in, and it's at a, uh, an angle. Uh, but the bow's here, and, this, and the stern is pointing this way. Bottom. And it just disappeared. Not a trace, pretty much just like this right here. 276 feet and 252 feet, and everything else is in the middle there. Uh, you can see the, the damage from the collision when the bow hit the, uh, the bottom. It's a rocky bottom. There's a little sediment on it, but it's mostly bedrock. So it came and hit and bent up. And uh, even the pilot house is uh, deep warm. Hatch covers are blown off, and there's, there's so much damage to the ship, it's, it's impossible to determine what was caused from the sinking and what was caused from the actual collision at the bottom. You know, you have air trapped in the uh, holes, and as it gets toward the bottom where the pressure is greater, uh, the air wants to come to the surface and blows the hatch covers off. There's a, there's a lot of damage done to the ship itself. The two lifeboats uh, broke loose and came to the surface. Uh, the lifeboats here are covered with a, a canvas cover. As on board, uh, there you have all kinds of life support equipment, food, water, flares things of that nature, so they had to keep it covered, protect it. And, uh, and as the air uh, inside, uh, you, the, the stern section is going underwater, the air just broke loose from the davits and came to the, the light bulb came to the surface. You can see the damage to the boats there uh, as, the, uh, as they came to the surface, they just broke apart. Uh, one of them is that uh, the Valley Camp, there's a, a freighter if you go up to Sault Ste. Marie. There's the Valley Camp ship over there. You can see that one of the lifeboats is there. The other one is at the uh, uh, Shipwreck Museum of Whitefish Point. So, yeah, boat number one, boat number two. So. Uh, there have been several, I think, eight explorations of the wreck itself. Um, when the Fitzgerald was launched in 1975, uh, they had a rough idea where it might have been. 
so they called on the United States Navy and they, uh, at the time a P-3 Orion, which was a type of aircraft, a four-engine aircraft they used to locate and if need be attack uh, Soviet submarines, uh, was called in to fly over that area. If they can find a submarine, they should be able to find uh, an idea where the hull is. So they flew over that area and they uh, pinpointed a location um, and uh, sent that. So there was a large metallic object in the bottom of Lake Superior. That's all they knew. The following spring, it was legally May of 1975, uh, a Navy, re, uh, Navy vessel entered the uh, Great Lakes and they had a tethered camera and sailed to uh, Whitefish, uh, south side of Whitefish Point further north, and uh, they put a camera um, and they explored that area that, that long that was uh, provided by the P-3, and that's where they officially uh, discovered the record of the Fitzgerald, so it really hasn't been lost very long at all. And uh, uh, they were able to, a couple of things, they, they came down, uh, the, the camera came down, and uh, they turned it. Um, and faced into where the radar said, you know, sonar said where the, uh, the record should be, and then ran right into it, almost right into it, the lights on. And the first thing you see is, uh, is MUND and FITC, so without question, they found the ship. And then they went up, they were on the other side, on the port side, and as they came up, they rose up, and they, they wanted to see what they <coughs> looking at the pilot house. And uh, they noticed at that point that all the windows with, with all the glass was blown in and they brought the submersible across to the front and uh, you could see into the pilot house. This is what they first saw uh, when the camera first shined on the Fitzgerald. You could see the NUND and FIT. And uh, just, I mean, when you're down there, they, you lose all ambient light, it's pitch black. No, all darkness and it's very, 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 very cold. And this is uh, one of my ear the eeriest photographs I could I've ever seen of the wreckage. You can see the damage to the pilot house from the collision on the bottom. All the glass is gone. This right there is the harness from a life jacket. It's floating on the ceiling of the pilot house. Someone went for the life jacket. It did, didn't happen. And uh, no one knows where they're at. Uh, they, I heard someone talk about the fact as it was coming down, it blew out all, all the, the pressure, blew in all the, uh, the glass. And if anyone was in the pilot house, they may have gone out the back when it was about the pilot house that was going down. There would have been uh, three or four people inside that pilot house at that time. That's a guesstimate. But uh, this is probably the curious picture I've seen of that. This is on the opposite side, on the starboard side of the, uh, uh, the pilot house. This is one side, a little bit up over here. But this is on the uh, starboard side of the ship. And uh, obviously, you see um, Evan Fitzgerald. This is the anchor. And I looked it up as we were talking about it. It weighs 12,290 pounds. It's actually stamped on it. Um, if, you, if you get on this side here and look right here, you look upside down, and it actually gives the date it was made. It was made 1974, I remember that. I believe it was July 1974. And it's again 12,290 pounds. And, uh, you know, First thing people were a little skeptical. Like, you mean you recovered this from the fish arrow? No, it was an accident. The um, year before it sank, January 1974, the fish arrow came down with a load of taconite to take up to uh, the Rouge Steel plant. And they had to wait until it was their turn to go up the Rouge River. So a mile west of Belle Isle is an anchorage on the American side. On the other side of the Ambassador Bridge is an anchorage on the Canadian side, so upbound ships can get out of the way over there, uh, downbound ships can get out of the way over here. 
So Fitzgerald went in to uh, wait her turn to go out and unload her cargo. And you have to turn the ship, come about using your thrusters and everything else to, to rotate the ship so you're facing into the current, which is going from north to south. All that water I talked about is trying to get over to Lake Erie as quickly as possible. So you, it's about a five mile an hour current there. So got into that area, faced into the, uh, the current and dropped uh, both anchors. There's, two, there's actually three anchors on the ship. Bow, uh, two port and starboard bow anchors, and then one in the stern. So uh, they went down, and this is the starboard bow anchor. And there's a, between the anchor chain and that shackle on the other end there is a master link that's about this big. It looks like a giant letter C, and you can easily tell what end went where. And then a block went inside, and there's a, a non-load bearing bolt goes in there, locks everything together. Something happened to that bolt, the locking element fell away, but you have a 12,000 pound anchor there. That's a lot of tension on that chain, it's not going anywhere. But when they put the anchor down on the bottom, released that tension, it got bolt. They realized they lost an anchor, and so they, uh, uh, in the process, there was a commercial diver that was going to go in and hook everything back together again. This is January 1974. There's a lot of ice in the Detroit River. At that particular time, there was. That diver was stuck underneath his dive boat for about 20, 30 minutes uh, because of all the ice coming through. He couldn't get up. So he finally made it up and said, I'm done. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sorry about your anchor, but I'm not going down. <laughs> and uh, so that was it. So they, they sort of said, well, we lost an anchor. So he contacted the company and said we had an accident. We lost the anchor in the Detroit River. And, you know, okay, well, we'll get you another one. And um, it was replaced, I think, uh, a few months later on. They did one of those things at Walmart. <laughs> so, um, that anchor was there. And of course, it was mentioned, a little sidebar story in a couple of places, uh, trade magazines, but no one paid attention to it. The Fitzgerald wasn't as popular as it is now, so everyone forgot about that anchor. Mm -hmm. And it was about 18 years later, um, a member uh, of the Great Lakes Maritime Institute was thumbing through something and came across story about the Fitzgerald losing an anchor in the Detroit River. So that, by then, Fitzgerald was, you know, quite popular. And uh, it had sung already, and, but everyone, you know, Gordon Lightfoot wrote his song and everything. Mm -hmm. So people were all excited about it. So that was the, uh, the catalyst for trying to find that anchor. We knew it was in the, in the Anchorage area, but, you know, it's there somewhere. So. They used a magnetometer and they did a, uh, a tr uh, track to that whole anchorage. And, and they, they picked up, I think it was like six or eight large anomalies of large metallic objects. Some were pipes or something, large pipes. But they went diving on every single one of them, and eventually one of them paid off and was the anchor. Well, how do you get that thing up? It's a 12,290 pound anchor. And so uh, it's going to be expensive, but it's something historically significant, um, and you know, a lot of, there was a lot of interest. I really forget it was in the 1990s, but uh, McGreevy, I think it was McGreevy, did a print on the uh, Fitzgerald, and it was signed and initialed. It was numbered, you know, limited editions. They were that was prints were sold to raise money for the recovery of the anchor. And Channel Four had a uh, program. You can even if you, if you go on YouTube, you can actually see it. It's called Live Dive, and it's focused. It's an hour long, but it was a long uh, hour long there. And um, they were going to. They did a whole series of uh, interviews with former crew members who were not on the ship at the time. Of people who knew the ship, uh, talk about different theories about it, and uh, do, you, do you remember a weatherman called Mel Sillers? Oh, yeah. Okay, he was a diver.
And so he did a live broadcast from the bottom of the Great River. And so he was down there, they had a cameraman, uh, a, a diver who was in the underwater photography. And he, he got the camera down underneath there on the out, so it was hanging on to stuff because he had a five mile an hour current. So he was down there and he was talking about it. And uh, uh, on this particular day, they, they had a barge come over. I, mean, I don't know who had the barge, maybe the Gaelic Tug Company, but it was held in place. And um, had a crane, the cable went down, wrapped around the shackle and pulled it up. What people don't know, I was, I was assistant curator at the museum at the time, and I was on the Diamond Jack because I had all these journalists who had been covering the story who had no idea about anything. So I was talking with them, I had fact sheets about the ship and about diving and everything else like that so they could get the story straight. So that's where I was. And uh, they had the uh, Detroit Police Harbor Master Divers were, were the safety divers. They, they provided all the uh, dive support for this effort. Um, uh, but what we people don't know is early, early that morning, they, they grabbed the anchor, secured it, and they pulled it up, and then they put it back down. Ralph <laughs> 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 Rivera, you know, you heard that story. Uh -huh. you know, they helped the phone stretcher. Yeah, we were not going to be embarrassed on live TV. <laughs> I put it back down again. I looked at it. Okay, everything's cool. And, and when they found the anchor, they found that giant missing, uh, that uh, master link, and they brought it up. And, and when I was working at, uh, at Dawson, when I talked to someone, I would actually bring that thing. It weighed about 50 pounds, and people could actually hold a piece of this jerk. Which a lot of people thought that was pretty cool. Um, have a question? Yeah. What is the maximum depth for the anchor? Like how how, how well, deep water was, can you be? Well, no, how deep? How much water? Yeah. Uh, I'm not really sure, but it's pretty pretty. It can go pretty deep. But not probably, probably about feet. maybe 100, okay. 150 feet, something like that. Yeah, the, the chain locker has a lot of chain in it. The, yeah. the links are, are pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, but the, this anchor here was found in about 27 feet of water. I mean, not, not more than 30 feet. So there has to be enough clearance draft so that the ships can go through there without any problems. So it's about 30 feet, something like that. So they uh, they brought it up and uh, put it on the barge, and you know, and then when it went, when the anchor broke the surface, all the boats that were in the area, you know, started blowing their horns. So and they put it in there, and then they, they later brought the barge up along where the uh, museum is, and they loaded it and put it on the ground, and then eventually it found its way to uh, over here. Well, this is actually the old site. Right now, you see that cove over there? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, at the point right over here, that's, that's, it doesn't look like that anymore. All that broken concrete's out of there, and uh, yeah, it, 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 you gotta go see it. But they, uh, there's a, a, a little monument up at the point of that cove. That's where she sits now. And then out on either side of the ship are the uh, names of the crew members. Where is that located? Sorry. Yeah, Bell Island. Yeah, the Dawson Bay Lakes Museum on Bell Island. Did they have a? Did they replace that anchor? I take it. Yeah, eventually they did. So the replacement anchor is now on the bottom of the Three anchors. Yeah, that was, I think it was like three or four months later on, they had another anchor, and uh, uh, they picked it up in, uh, in Cleveland at a dock. It was sitting on the dock in Cleveland, and they had the chain to it, and they just kind of pulled it in. So, so this is the largest piece of the Edmund Fitzgerald above the water. And we were talking about the bell. I don't know what the date was when they actually pulled this up. But you see, this is this has that patina on it. It doesn't look like this now. It's all polished brass. I, I, I think this is more powerful than the polished brass now. But uh, Evans and Cheryl, what they did, uh, I think there was eight expeditions on the wreck itself. And as we, I discussed uh, earlier, uh, it was it's located in Canadian waters. So the, Government of Canada has jurisdiction over everything in the water, so. 
at the uh, request of the family, um, uh, no further explorations is, uh, are, are allowed. No, no permits will be granted for further explore, exploration of the end of this year. Yeah. And so, um, but they did. And uh, I think we did this. Uh, I think it's the uh, people of the supporting organization for the Great Lake Shepherd uh, Museum. They uh, recast the bell with the names of every single member of the crew member on it. And then that was mounted on a, uh, uh, a stanchion. And that was what they did. They, they, had a, they had a very interesting, they had a mechanical dive suit called the Newt suit. I don't know why. And uh, he was lowered down there. And uh, he had a cutting torch, and he cut the stanchions of the of that bell, and that was hooked up ahead of time. And on his command, it was raised to the surface. And then they raised, they took the other one with the names on it, and lowered it down, and that is now resting, secured, resting on the uh, pilot house of this girl. as a fitting memorial to uh, the loss of the crew. And, uh, that's located at Whitefish Point. <coughs> I've had people come to Dawson trying to find that mountain and they find it several hundred miles away. And this is a list of the all, all the crew members of the ship. Captain Ernest McSorley, who's a master. Uh, these, these guys who sail this, uh, there was a, one on here, was on, again, I don't know who it is. But this was his very first time on a ship. So these are all the uh, all the names of our, all the crew members. There. The, the masters and first mate, you know, and, and your chief engineer are all very experienced uh, mariners. So. Were they all Americans or? Uh, as far as I know, they're all Americans. So. I'm just curious, was the Arthur Anderson being so close? They weren't able to do anything. I mean, well, they had no idea. The, but no one in the Fitzgerald even mentioned that they were in trouble. Mm -hmm. so and they, didn't uh, see it. they weren't close enough to see anything. No, they were about nine miles away. Okay. So uh, what happened? Uh, they lost contact. They tried to raise contact with the uh, uh, the Fitzgerald. There was nothing but static. Uh, then they uh, uh, Bernie Cooper uh, on the. At, at Dawson, they have a, a recording of the conversation between the three. The commander of the Coast Guard Station is Hussein Marie, Bernie Cooper on the uh, Arthur Anderson, and Don Erickson on the William Clay Ford. The William Clay Ford was uh, anchored in Whitefish Bay riding out the storm, and don't need to go into that mess, so they were going to get up there in the morning, and uh, the conditions were supposed to improve. Um, so they're out in Whitefish Bay, fine, everything's great, but they started monitoring the uh, situation uh, between the Fitzgerald and Anderson. The Anderson made it through okay? Yeah, it was uh, made it through. Sir, what was the uh, barometric pressure that night? Do you know? No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I, I asked because, ask that question. I don't know. because <laughs> In 98, I was on an island on Lake Michigan and, and uh, was a, uh, at the hurricane level storm. And the, uh, the, uh, the ranger on the island told me that it was the lowest recorded barometric pressure since that night in 75. Uh, just, I always wondered what it was. I talked to people who lived in Sault Ste. Marie that night, and uh, they said it was horrendous. Mm -hmm. uh, parts of uh, houses being blown away and washed away, and it wasn't even, it was just not even part, uh, not even on the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sir? In regard to those names that were going to about the bodies, were any bodies later recovered that they all uh, No one was ever recovered. Uh, a lot of speculation about that because the water is very cold mm -hmm. and for the bodies to come to the surface, it's part of the decomposition process. Gases in the body are created and that comes to the surface, but it's like a refrigerator down there. So just above freezing. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Is were they lost in what's called the Michigan Triangle? 
Have you heard of that? I'm sorry? Or they lost in what is called the Michigan Triangle? Uh, I don't think that even exists. <laughs> Here? Well. Yeah, I've, I've heard stories about that yeah. too. And I've been able to. But uh, it, um, the, uh, what, what happened, uh, you know, when the fifth, you know, in response to your question, ma'am, is that when the uh, Fitzgerald uh, Anderson realized that Fitzgerald wasn't there, wasn't responding, they contacted the Coast Guard station at Sault Ste. Marie and told them everything that they knew about it. And there was a, uh, a process called situational awareness, trying to figure out what was going on. When was the last time you, you, you talked to the Fitzgerald? Did they say anything back and forth? And uh, eavesdropping on that conversation was the uh, William Clay Ford. And so they contacted the William Clay, well, no, uh, Don Erickson, just, did the Fitzgerald make it in and they didn't happen to see it? They thought maybe the ship may have come in, Whitefish Bay, but uh, William Clay was very prominent at the entrance of Whitefish Bay and no ship came in. Even on their radar, they could see there's nothing came into Whitefish Bay. So that started a conversation back and forth. Uh, the Coast Guard, the closest Coast Guard vessel was the uh, Woodrush, which was in Duluth, Minnesota. So they got a, uh, a, a an alarm recall for the crew, and they got underway in less than a half an hour. But it would take eight hours to get from Duluth, Minnesota, to Whitefish Bay. A long time. So if anyone was in the water, your life expectancy in, in, in the water and seas at that time, if you're floating in like like the Titanic, for example, you, your life expectancy is about 15 minutes. So. Uh, the commander of the Coast Guard station asked, he asked, actually asked a salt water ship if they would turn around and come back, and they said no. <laughs> and uh, so they, they asked if they would, asked uh, Erickson to go, and you can hear his response in that recording. He's not excited about the prospects. Like, well, I don't know, you know, basically something like that. So he talked it over with uh, the first mate. It was like, just about three or four guys in the in the, the pilot house at the time, back in the chart room. And uh, he said, well, what do you guys think? You know, and I said, well, you're the skipper, you tell us what to do and we'll do it. So, you know, he, the Erickson thought about it and he said, well, we've got to get the Duluth, we might as well go now. But he's, re he's, he's responsible for the ship and everyone on it. It's a hell of a responsibility. So he has to make some pretty solid decisions at that point. So what they agreed to do was get underway and head out and uh, go to Duluth early. And they just left and went out and kept on going until they got to Duluth. Uh, they went out and the Anderson came in in Whitefish Bay, came about and went out. So the ships were about, about a mile apart when they started heading out there. There was a helicopter uh, launched from uh, Traverse City. There's an air station there, and they flew to Whitefish Bay at you know, the request of the Coast Guard once again. An alarm was sent down there, uh, a ship launched. So they launched, and they came up that way. On board that ship was a pilot, co pilot, a uh, crew chief, and a rescue swimmer. And uh, same type of people they have over at uh, the Selfridge where I work. I see those guys launch all the time. And uh, so, anyways, they, they flew up that way and they went uh, all the way up uh, to Whitefish Bay and, and uh, flew up that way. And, and the way's 30, 35 feet high. You're not going to launch a, uh, a rescue swimmer because you'll never see him again. Mm -hmm. So they flew up that way. They knew about the ships going out, you know, the two freighters going out into that area. So they flew in front of them, dropped all illumination flares in front of them, and they expended all their flares, and then they turned around and made a run back. And I was telling David about this that uh, I moved, uh, I took the job over at Selfridge about two and a half years ago. It was probably about four and a half, five years ago. I was underneath the pilot house of the Waste Lake Board talking about this incident. And uh, there was about 20, 30 people of their visitors uh, listening. 
and one guy was sitting on the steps over there, and afterwards he had some questions, and he was the crew chief on that helicopter. Oh. And he had he had no idea what, what had happened. They went out, and uh, so he, he sat me and said, wow, let's talk. So we, we sat there, we talked a little bit. He wanted to know more information. I had, I wanted to know more about what he had. He said that when they, they went over there, they, they expended all their flares, and they couldn't stay any longer because of the, the fuel, the amount of fuel they had, and they made the run back to uh, uh, Traverse City. They landed, and they were taxing to a uh, hangar, and they ran out of fuel. Oh. It was that close. He says, yeah, we're there. And, uh, so they stayed as long as they could. They did everything they could, but then they just had to... That was it. And nothing else they could do to get back. Um, after they found where the Fitzgerald was uh, sunk, where they, you know, they positively identified it, they checked the logbook of the uh, William Clay Ford, and according to the logbook, they went directly over the wreckage of the Fitzgerald. And, uh, but there was nothing in the in the, uh, in the water. Uh, uh, they uh, they couldn't see anything and no debris or anything. Uh, I later talked. There was one time I talked with. Uh, several of the crew members, one guy was on the Anderson at that time, and there was other guys who sailed on the, not the Anderson, the William Clay Ford. And uh, these were all crew members, about five or six crew members of the William Clay Ford that sailed on her at different times uh, during her history. Um, she sailed from 1953 to 1989, and in 1979 they extended her 120 feet, so she was once again, longer than the Fitzgerald at that point. But she was like 640-some feet uh, and that night. And uh, uh, some of those guys were telling me about the, uh, there were two guys that were on the ship that, that night and went out. And they said it was, they weren't excited about going out there, but it was just, you know, you hope that something happened to you that someone would go out. And he says, we had no idea how, if they saw anyone in the water, how they would ever get them. You just can't launch a lifeboat because you won't see that again. And you just can't turn around, you know, with waves uh, 30, 35 feet high. And, uh, but as it turned out, no one had, they, they didn't have to worry about things like that. You just couldn't see anyone. There's no evidence of anyone there. Yes, ma'am. So the William Clay Ford went from Whitefish Point to Duluth. Yes. That night, and I think the original slide said Edna Fitzgerald sank at 7:15 p.m. So, what time did the William Clay Ford cross? Approximately. It might have been nine, around 9:30, oh, 10 wow. o'clock, something like that. It was just it was far enough after because they, they, they had, you know, um, you know, to get the ship going again, you know, you just don't put the key in the ignition. You know, right. They had to, <laughs> they had to uh, tell the chief engineer to get the. Uh, Feature brings up, and uh, and then once you get that rolling, then you have to pull up the stern anchor first, and then the bow anchors, and so on and so forth, and, and get get underway. And so it's uh, quite a involved process. But you know, at, or earlier they didn't even know that this girl was gone. Thought it might have made Whitefish Bay at that point, or it sank. Where did it sink? I don't know. So yes, ma'am. So the life suits you were describing earlier, is that a, a newer invention or did they have those? They just couldn't What the exposure suit? The exposure suits. Yeah, yeah, it takes a while to put them on. So they do they have them on that? I, I don't think they have them at that time. Okay, I just curious. Yeah. I had a I had a young man who was, you know, we we're, were talking about when I pulled one out and uh, I says, Okay, go, you know, and just trying to put it on. It took him about fifteen minutes to put it on. Of course he was he you know, I still you know, sit down, just, just gonna kick his shoes off and go, no, 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 I'll put it right over everything. And uh, it took them about 15 minutes. But they had drills and things like that. They just, you know, so you every all the crew members. So you need some advanced warning. Yeah, you need some, you need some time. Yeah, but it was, uh, if you had to go into a lifeboat, it would extend your life by from 15 minutes to probably 12, 20 hours, something like that. So, <coughs> 
I'm just going to add that um, I, I know that most of you know the ins and outs of this uh, through all the books that are out there and everything. But uh, of course, the Gordon Lightfoot song talks about the 29 uh, men that were killed uh, that died on this. And uh, our neighbor, uh, we grew up on Yorkshire between St. Paul and Perchville. And our neighbor, two doors down, was Reverend Ingalls, who at the time uh, was at Old Mariner's Church. He yeah. oversaw it. And he was the actual, he rang the 29 bells, from what I understand, uh, there. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite remarkable, uh, you know, knowing that. And, uh, a lovely family too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I Ingalls, I remember the name. Um, we had people come to Dawson when I was working there. Had people come there to see that, and they always ask for where is that Mariner's Church at? You know, and it's there. They, well, they you know you just have to look for it. But if you get in the wrong lane, you're on your way to Canada. But, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know, I think it's open. You know, for visitors, I think. I don't know. It used to be, but uh, do they do the anniversary? Yes. You know, the anniversaries they have it over there. They have, they have two anniversaries. One, uh, they have the Lost Mariners Remembrance at Dawson Great Lakes Museum on the night of November 10th, whatever you know, at whatever day of the week it is, and um, um, I'm usually there. Uh, helping out when I can, but they have a, uh, they have different boats like from Coast Guard or uh, Canadian and American police boats and things like that. And they come up there and a Coast Guard boat comes up and receives a wreath and backs off to mid-channel and puts that in the water. That it has 29 roads on it. And that flows down and probably ends out toward uh, wind down. Yes. Well, I, I've been to that ceremony. I uh, my wedding anniversary is November 10th. I didn't come from Kentucky, I had no idea what the day was chosen, but we often go to that ceremony and several years ago you were there, the folk singer singing his song oh, yeah. and he says, um, the line and her, uh, all that remains are the faces and the names of the wives and the sons and the daughters. Yeah. And the cook's daughter was there and she stood up. You remember that? Yeah, we yeah, one of the daughters. Uh, it was so powerful. There. She, um, I forget which. She just stood up and then she sat down. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was really something. I was there for the 25th and they had several captains out in the, in the lobby. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about their experiences just within days of that. How, how much ice was on their ship was breaking it off with uh, axes. And, yeah, you have, you have to have axes and hammers, you have to break it off, but that's extra weight on the, on the ship, and it brings it down. So, I think it's okay, yes, ma'am. Do you think that the lifeboats came up after the plane? After it sank, the, the, the air, air was trapped underneath it because of the canvas covers, and uh, when they got deep enough, they pressured it. It broke loose and changed the surface. Do you think that other boat cars have been dying? I have no idea. I have no idea. But there, there, was, there was, yeah. So they found him later on in the morning. And there's a there's a guy who I, I talked with, and eight days after the sinking of the ship, he found a life ring, orange life ring, that's with Edmund Fitzgerald on it. A wave blew it onto the shore. He found it. It's now on temporary loan to the. Great Lake Shipwreck Museum, and I believe in July he called me up and he said it's for sale now. Oh. It's been appraised for $30,000. But, you know, so I just, or, or best off. So, but I, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I, I, Dawson, yeah, the Detroit Historical Site, I have to raise that kind of money for everybody else. I know. You know, so. Anyone out there with deep pockets uh, and <laughs> you know, got an investment opportunity? That's, as far as I know, that's the only life ring that was ever recovered from the ship. Normally, those things are not secured because you have to grab them, you know, to eat them. So I don't know what happened to the rest of them. That's that. 
Any other questions? Speak now and forever hold your peace. Okay, well, I'll, okay. Not that in there. Well, right, yeah. I mean, it's a curiosity. Uh, we're here as members of the, the Great Lakes, right? Yeah. What relationship does it have to Detroit, really, aside from the Mariners Church? Or is there, am I missing that? Um, It's a Great Lakes. Yeah, yeah it's actually story. yeah, it's it's Great Lakes uh, related, and the and, and the Fitz King guy passed it for a lot. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, although it had Milwaukee on the stern, you know, it was uh, uh, based primarily out of Cleveland. So it took a lot of tech and I can hire an order with the green plan. But it was it the service to Detroit. Detroit. Yeah, they sure did. Yeah. And, yeah. and everything, Detroit workers. Geographically, it's probably the most significant location in the Great Lakes because everything goes from the upper lakes to the lower lakes. That's come right past the city. So. And that's what uh, that's what Detroit means. It means the straits. That's the only French I know. <laughs> so, but anyways, uh, thank you very much for.